Throughout the history of Magic, plenty of cards have come and gone and not made any real impact on the game. However, sometimes a card will be considered quite bad by the community that still saw some play. Today, we're going to go over underdogs, cards that are, at first glance, unplayable pack filler, but have actually managed to see revelance at some point. To get on this list, a card had to have topped at at least one big event, if not more, as well as being generally bad overall. Starting us off at number 10, we have Undiscovered Paradise. This is a land with an ability where you can tap it for one mana of any color. And at the beginning of your next untapped step, as you untap your permanence, you return Undiscovered Paradise to your hand. This is a very punishing land to play, as returning a land to your hand will severely restrict your mana production on your future turns. If you play Paradise as your land every single turn, you'll be stuck at one mana for the entire game, or have to skip out on tapping it for a turn to try and play another land. Neither of these options are particularly good. To put it lightly. For this massive downside, you get a land that can tap for any color of mana, which is certainly very powerful, but generally not worth dealing with these downsides. Cards like City of Brass can tap for any color and only ask for you to pay some life in exchange for this increased consistency, a trade that most players are far more willing to take. Despite all these flaws, Undiscovered Paradise has still managed to see some play as of recently as 2019. While the downside of bouncing back to your hand is quite debilitating for most fair decks, if you're not actually planning on casting most of your spells, it doesn't really matter all that much. This is why the card has occasionally been used in vintage dredge builds. These are decks built around the dredge mechanic, which allow you to return the card from your graveyard to your hand and mill a number of cards instead of drawing a card. This mechanic has allowed players to build powerful graveyard decks based around dredge, returning creatures directly from the graveyard to the field. One of these threats is Blood Gas, which has the landfall trigger to return itself from the graveyard to the field. Additionally, one of the only spells the decks would ever really be interested in casting is Cabal Therapy in certain builds, which only costs one black mana to cast from your hand. Paradise was able to pop back to your hand over and over to repeatedly bring back Blood Gas as well as being able to cast Cabal Therapy, meaning that despite all the downsides of the card that make it almost useless in most decks, there's one deck where the card still is able to see play. Now, it's not the most common thing to see in the format. Lots of vintage dredge decks don't play any lands besides exactly Bizarre Baghdad, skipping out on Blood Gas, meaning that Paradise isn't useful for those builds. Still, the card seeing any play at all is more than most players would expect. And at number 9, we have Pyromancer's Goggles. This is a legendary artifact with the mana cost of 5. It is the ability where you can tap it to add 1 red mana. When this mana is spent to cast a red instant or sorcery spell, you copy that spell. Then you can choose new targets for the copy. Goggles is the exact kind of card you would expect to never see play in Standard. It's an expensive card that does absolutely nothing the turn you play it that requires other cards to do anything worthwhile, but has a nice, powerful looking ability stapled onto it. In most formats, tapping out for goggles would just lose you a lot of games against aggro decks and simply not do enough against most of the rest of the field to be worth playing. However, after being in Standard for several months after the release of Magic Origins, the card received a partner to play alongside it. This card was Fall of the Titans, a card that also could have been on this list. This is an instant with a mana cost of XX and 1 red. X can be paid with any amount of mana as long as both Xs are the same. It is the effect where it deals X damage to each up to two targets. It also has Surge for X and 1 red, meaning you can cast it for the cost if you cast another spell this turn. Fall of the Titans is another potentially powerful card that's just too difficult to actually make work most of the time as you need to have a ton of mana available not only to dump into it, but to cast a spell before it and try to be able to pay the surge cost instead. However, Goggles gave this card the exact partner it needed to actually do something. While the card would normally require a ton of mana to get up and running, Goggles can make casting the card with surge for around 2 or 3 mana more than worth it. By targeting the same creatures with both copies, you can easily destroy most creatures with fall, getting you a powerful 2 for 1. And of course, in the late game, where you have 10 or more mana lying around, you can just dump all of your mana into a fall and copy it to burn your opponent for whatever's left of their life total. Now, this wasn't exactly amazing. You were still playing two cards that weren't amazing on their own. However, this synergy did form the backbone of a blue-red ramp deck that picked up top 8s in big tournaments, despite the deck not being all that great. There's a good chance that, without both of these cards being in standard together, neither would have been able to see any play at all. But these pretty clunky and overall bad cards were able to cover each other's weaknesses and pull off quite the upset. And at number 8, we have Battle of Wits. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 3 and 2 blue. It is the ability where, at the beginning of your upkeep, if you have 200 more cards in your library, you win the game. Like most alternate win conditions, this card is supposed to be a casual, gimmicky strategy that wasn't really competitive. 
Battle of Wits requiring you to play over 200 cards in your deck in order for the card to go off has a few big issues. Namely, that finding enough playable cards to fill your deck with is quite the challenge. Even if you max out your playsets, you're probably going to be looking for around 35 different cards you'll need to play. This will require you to not only not play the best cards for any job, but to go down the list for the third or fourth best options for anything your deck wanted. It's hard to state just how bad this actually is. Most of the time, a standard format won't have more than two or three viable spells in any color for a particular role thanks to the smaller card pool. And in older formats, it's actually even worse. In formats like Modern, you have to be playing not just good cards, but exceptional cards to keep up with the metagame. Despite all of these pitfalls, Battle of Wits has actually put up results. Or at least, one result worth mentioning. All the way back in 2002, a Battle of Wits deck made it to a top 8 of a Grand Prix Milwaukee. The only top the card has managed in any large tournament. This deck list is recorded for us online, and you can really just see how bad Battle of Wits is by looking over this deck list. The deck is on 92 lands and has to play cards like Salt Marsh and other unplayable dual lands simply because the format didn't have enough high rarity lands to build a competent mana base for the deck. In terms of spells, it's even worse. The deck was playing basically every halfway decent drawable spell and removal spell in the format. The deck was even playing Hobble, an aura that stopped the enchanted creature from attacking and cycled when it entered the battlefield, and was a generally unplayable card. However, the deck had over 200 slots to fill and Hobble could at least remove a creature for a while assuming your opponent didn't find any enchantment removal. Battle of Wits is a pretty awful card, and the fact that this deck was able to make it so far into such a large tournament is shocking, though not as shocking as some of the other cards that appeared on this list. And at number 7, we have Send to Sleep. This is an instant with a mana cost of 1 and 1 blue. It is the effect where you tap up to 2 target creatures, and it has spell mastery. This means that if you have 2 or more instant slash sorcery cards in your graveyard, you get a bonus effect. With Send to Sleep, you get the effect where those creatures don't untap during their controller's next untap step. These types of tapping effects are as common as they are unimpressive. Cards like Ojutai's Breath pop up in most standard formats and are merely draft fodder. The issue with these types of mechanics is that the card disadvantage they give you is simply too much for the tempo they offer to really be worth it. Often, what would happen with these kinds of effects is you would tap a couple of your opponent's creatures, saving yourself some damage, and they would continue to develop their board while you'd find another actual removal spell to stop taking damage. Once the creatures you tapped down finally did untap, you'd often be in a horrible spot with way more damage than you were ready for coming at you. These tap effects were usually best in more aggressive decks, where tapping down your opponent's creatures translate into more damage, rather than just preventing some damage to you. The final nail in the coffin for most of these kinds of tapping spells is how expensive they are, as they'd often take up your entire turn with their high mana value, often costing around 3 or even 4 mana. However, Send to Sleep was quite a bit better than most of these other tapping spells, on top of finding itself in a much better position to actually see play. For one, it only costs 2 mana, and locks the best part of the effect behind spell mastery. While this does mean you can't use this spell early on in the game, you also wouldn't be casting Send to Sleep on turn 2 anyway. Waiting until turn 3 or 4 was more than fine, at which point you'd easily be able to cast both Send to Sleep and some other spell on your turn. This lower mana value made it a lot better than other tapping effects, but it's a bit strange to see the card seeing play at all. Why not simply play better removal? Well, in Send to Sleep Standard, there were multiple decks that wanted to slow the game down, but didn't really have access to the hard removal of black, or the board wipes of white. Blue-red and blue-green decks both needed more interaction to survive into the late game, where their powerful card advantage engines or high draw mana value threats respectively could take over the game. If they had a better piece of blue interaction to lean on, they likely would have. But Send to Sleep was far and away the best way the decks had to interact with their opponent in blue at the time. While the card only topped a few events, Send to Sleep had a fairly unique combination of mana value and effect let it fill a role that no other card could really have done. And at number 6, we have Pilgrim's Eye. This is a 1-1 artifact creature thopter with a mana cost of 3. It has flying, meaning it can't be blocked except by creatures with flying or reach. It also has the ability where, when it enters the field, you search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle. Pilgrim's Eye is mostly draft chaff, there to help players build better mana bases in a format of all the low rarity lands getting drafted by other players. The card has always been printed at common, further cementing his role. In Constructed, the card is very underwhelming. A 1-1 for 3 mana is very bad, even with flying. The card just doesn't impact the board very much, being too weak to put a clock on your opponent, and being too frail to survive combat with literally any creatures besides zero power creatures, 
which you won't run into basically ever in competitive settings. The ability to find a basic land is fine, but not exciting. You'd never play a card only for that. Even cards like Lay of the Land, which only costs one mana, and allows you to find a basic land, have basically never seen play due to the effect being too marginal to put an entire card into your deck for. Despite all of these downsides, Pilgrim's Eye has seen a surprising amount of play. The card has popped up into a few different decks. The most meaningful was right after the release of Eldritch Moon. Right after this deck came out, one of the best decks was built around Emerge, and in particular the card Elder Deep Fiend. This is a 5-6 Eldrazi Octopus with a mana cost of 8. It has Flash, meaning it can be cast at instant speed, the ability where when you cast it, you tap up to 4 target permanents, and finally it has the titular Emerge ability for 5 and 2 blue. This is an ability that lets you sacrifice a creature to cast a spell for its Emerge cost. And if you do, it costs X less to cast, with X is the sacrifice creature's mana value. Elder Deep Fiend was an insane threat, basically letting you skip an opponent's entire turn by tapping all their mana and developing your board with a massive threat. Pilgrim's Eye was paired alongside the Deep Fiend due to it essentially giving you everything the card wanted. It was a 3 mana creature that could be sacrificed to let you cast Deep Fiend for 4 mana, as early as you could cast it, and since it found you a basic land, you'd always have the next land drop you'd need to cast the Fiend. This ended up being the most consistent way to cast your merge threats on time, leading to the card seeing a ton of play. Outside of Emerge, the eye paired well with another one of Innistrad's big themes this time around, Delirium. This was a mechanic that would give you a bonus for having four or more different card types amongst the cards in your graveyard, and had a variety of powerful cards. Pilgrim's Eye also saw play in these decks as it put an artifact card into your graveyard, one of the most uncommon card types in the game, and drew you a basic land, which made it better than just casting most other bad artifact creatures. The fact the card didn't do anything when you played it didn't really matter when your top end was as good as Ishkana and Emrakul the Promised End. Despite the card itself being quite bad, Pilgrim's Eye happened to make other cards so strong that it was a very common card to see running around back in Eldritch Moon Standard. And at number 5, we have Slash Panther. This is a 4-2 artifact creature cat with a mana cost of 4 and 1 Phyrexian Red, meaning it can be paid with either 1 Red or 2 Life. It has haste, being it can attack the turn it enters the battlefield. Panther is a very, very mediocre card. Paying 4 mana for 4-2 is pretty bad, and haste isn't anywhere near a good enough ability to make up for how bad Panther's stats are. The card didn't see any play back in standard, and in fact, hasn't seen play in almost any format. The only place the card has really seen play is all the way back in Vintage, the most powerful format in all of Magic. The reason for this starts not with the deck that played Panther, but the decks they were playing against. One of the very powerful cards in the format was Jace the Mind Sculptor, a planeswalker with multiple powerful abilities. The most common play pattern of the card was to cast it and then use its zero ability to draw three cards, and then put two cards from your hand on top of your library. Despite Jace's high mana value for a format like Vintage, coming in at four mana, the card could easily win games it resolved in. Players would generally just repeatedly activate the zero ability to bury their opponent in a mountain of card advantage, not to mention all the card selection the ability could give you. This led to a problem for shop decks. This is a deck built around the land, Mistra's Workshop, which could be tapped to add three colorless mana, but you could only spend this mana on artifact spells. This deck was incredibly powerful, but it did have a bit of an issue against Jace. The deck didn't really have any way of answering a resolved Jace unless it happened to already have several powerful threats in play. The deck couldn't dip into other colors for more answers, as it was too reliant on its colorless lands to play colored cards. So the deck needed a colorless way to kill Jace, and the best answer was Slash Panther. This 4 power haste creature was an artifact, allowing it to be cast off a workshop and was able to come down and kill Jace if your opponent didn't have a blocker. This gave the deck a much needed answer to a threat that it otherwise wouldn't be able to out. While in more recent times the card has been usurped by Flame Wheel Cruiser, this doesn't negate all the play the card has seen up until now. And at number 4 we have Iron Claw Orcs. This is a 2-2 orc with a mana cost of 1 and 1 red. It is the ability where it can't block creatures with power 2 or greater. A 2 mana 2-2 two -two with only a downside is pretty pitiful by modern standards, but it's important to remember this card in the proper context. The card was printed in Alpha, the very first set of magic, and creatures were a lot worse back then. However, even all the way back in Alpha, this creature was quite bad. Its stats just weren't very impressive, especially when it could barely block anything. If you could play anything else, you almost certainly would. The operative word here though is could. Unfortunately for red plays at the time, there really weren't any other options. 
Back in the earliest days of the game, Mono Red Aggro was quite the strong deck, thanks in no small part to cards like Fire Blast, which deals 4 damage to any target and can be cast for no mana by sacrificing 2 mountains, or cards like Ball Lightning. Mono Red was, overall, a very powerful deck with a lot of great cards. However, you were short a few actually good cards, and the deck really needed a few more creatures to try and put pressure on your opponent. Somehow, the best option the deck had access to was Iron Claw Orcs, a creature that people weren't exactly stoked to be playing, even this early on into the game's history. Orcs doesn't really have anything to offer outside of its middle and stat line, so it's no surprise that outside of this brief stint of playability back in the early days of Standard, the card hasn't really done anything, and is very unlikely to at any other point in the future. At number 3, we have Isan Shade. This is a 5-5 Legendary Shade Knight with a mana cost of 3 and 3 black. It has protection from white, meaning it can't be blocked by, targeted by, damaged by, enchanted, or equipped by anything of that attribute. This is another very old card, printed in the infamously underwhelming set of Homelands. The shade is similarly unimpressive, failing the vanilla test and only having a single keyword ability to sweeten the pot. Protection abilities are very powerful as they shut down tons of forms of interaction, but protection on its own usually isn't enough for a card to see play. Most of the time, your opponent will find some way to work around the protection. These types of cards often find use as sideboard cards to be brought in when they happen to stack up well against specific decks. Shade ended up seeing far more play than it had any right to in the early days of the game for this exact reason. Very few decks had a good answer to a shade. Blue and green were very limited in their turns of removal, with blue needing to use their limited copies of control magic effects to remove it from the field or resort to counter spells or bounce spells, which had their own limitations. Of the colors that did have access to powerful removal, they all had issues of their own. White obviously had trouble with the card, having to rely on their wraths to answer the creature. Black's removal was also quite limited, as black had issues in the early days of magic, with most of the removal spells were cards like Terror, which couldn't remove black creatures. The last color with consistent removal was red, though its best removal cards were things like Incarnate, which just did slightly too little damage to answer it. Instead, they'd have to use multiple burn spells or wait until they had enough mana to kill it with Fireball. And even then, that would probably take up their entire turn. This is all to say that in the very earliest set of Magic, players didn't have that many good ways to out an Isan Shade. This let the card see way more play as the top end of far more black decks than anyone looking back on the format would have guessed at first glance. And at number 2, we have Stormbind. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 1, 1 red, and 1 green. It has the ability where you can pay 2 and discard a card at random to deal 2 damage to any target. This is a pretty inconsistent ability. While the ability to turn any card in your hand into a slightly overpriced shock is still quite good, the randomness of the ability kills almost any playability the card would have. It's far too risky to activate with any cards you actually plan on casting in your hand. Discarding an important card at an inopportune time will often just lose you the game, so you have to make sure you can only use it while your hand is full of garbage. Still, despite these obvious shortcomings, the card can at least have some impact on the game, so it's not completely inconceivable that the card would see some play. The far more shocking thing isn't that people tried the card out, but that it was able to get multiple tops. In fact, the card was included in what is universally considered to be the absolute worst deck to ever win a pro tour. The deck was called Red Green Spiders, and almost nothing about it makes sense. The deck was playing two copies of Stormbind, which honestly was one of the better cards it was playing. With stellar threats like Wooly Spider and Giant Trap Door Spider, it might be shocking to some that more people weren't experimenting with the brew. Sarcasm aside, the deck is famous amongst the MDG community for its multiple questionable card choices. The spiders themselves are bad enough to deserve being on the list in their own right, middling 3 mana creatures with niche abilities at best. The deck also played a full play set of Deadly Insect, a 5 mana 6-1 that can't be targeted by any player, which does make it immune to removal, but can easily be killed by even the cheapest creatures around. It's hard to cast a Deadly Insect into anything but an entirely empty board without feeling bad about it. The deck also played a playset of Urza's Bauble and Lodestone Bauble, two cards that did basically nothing and let you draw a card on the next turn, seemingly just to try and draw into more garbage creatures. It's a bit hard to figure out how this deck was able to win any game, let alone a major event, but it did apparently happen. Still, there's one card that deserves number one spot on this list a bit more than the representative of this terrible deck. And all the way at number one, we have Serrated Arrows. This is an artifact with a mana cost of four. It has abilities where it enters the field with three arrowhead counters on it. At the beginning of your upkeep, if the card has no arrowhead counters on it, you sacrifice it. And you can tap it and remove an arrowhead counter from the arrows to put a minus one minus one counter on target creature. This is a very slow removal spell, 
and can only kill creatures with three or less toughness and takes three turns to do it. Though the card does have at least some upsides. If your opponent is only playing one toughness creatures, this card is actually quite strong. It can snipe up to three different creatures, giving you a huge swing and card advantage if it killed all three of them. While this is potentially quite powerful, this isn't quite good enough to spend an entire card on, at least most of the time. It's just a bit too clunky and cards like Pyroclasm and Contagion were a lot stronger if you had access to them. However, despite all of these pitfalls, the card saw quite a bit of play back in its standard format. You may be expecting me to go into a long diatribe about a specific card or metagame that allowed this card to excel, but that's not going to happen. Instead, Arrows worms its way into this list via some good old fashioned corporate greed. You see, back in the early days of Magic, Wizards had a bit of a hard time balancing sets. They weren't quite sure what made cards work yet, and had decided to do some additional experimenting with the set Homelands. This resulted in what may be one of the most unplayable sets ever released, to the point that players had no reason to open packs of the set at all. In order to salvage the set, Wizards introduced one of the most brazenly greedy rules ever put to paper. At the time, standard decks were required to play at least 5 cards from every set in rotation, essentially forcing players to buy new homeland packs and at least put something into their decks. As a result, players were scrambling to find the least bad cards from homelands to play in their decks, or more often, just their sideboards. And nothing says least bad card in the set like serrated arrows. Arrows could at least do something when you played it, often at least killing a single creature, which was more than could be said for the majority of cards in Homelands. As a result, the card saw a ton of competitive play in the format despite the fact that it wasn't very good. Years later, the card would have a resurgence of playability in Pauper, a format based entirely around comments. Arrows was able to kill multiple creatures over the course of a few turns, and better yet, worked with Pauper All-Star Core Skyfisher, that return cards to your hand when it entered the battlefield. This could let you do a ton of damage to your opponent's board with arrows if you had the six turns to wait. Over time, the card has fallen out of favor in the format as players have just found better things to do. Arrows has one of the most interesting histories of any card in Magic, a relic from the bygone era where wizards played a lot more fast and loose with the rules. While it won't be seen much if any more play into the future, its legacy will go down in the game's history. All right, and that's the list. Are there any other cards you think we may have missed, or have any ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, let us know down in the comments below.